Last on Everdark, Damon and Julian confront Kaemon. They discover that Kaemon's master, Artemis Eleusius, or really the immortal Kali, forced him to kill the Harrows, but Kaemon was able to bargain with him to save Julian. Kaemon has now sought them out, as he realizes that Kali intends for him to be the fall guy with Damon, and he's done with that. Everdark, Episode 67 Ally or Enemy Sweat coated Christian's upper lip as he tried to draw David into the diamond, but his former lover stayed in the corner no matter how much he willed David near him. David's eyes were filled with grief, but also he was determined not to be imprisoned in the diamond. Lizette wasn't letting him leave altogether, though. She sipped blood, ankles crossed, expression serene as she effortlessly kept David's soul in the room for Christian to practice on. Christian wiped a hand across his forehead. It isn't working, or I'm not doing it right. I can feel him, but I can't move him, Christian said, and his whole body slumped forward, shaking from the effort. Yet, it isn't working yet. I can feel you reaching towards him. You are powerful, Christian, but it is like a person trying to play a piano with a hammer, Lizette remarked. Her flawless forehead furrowed. Being a speaker makes you different from a pure Kali. There must be something in how you impose your will upon the dead that is vastly different from ours. She frowned slightly. Keep trying. Perhaps I will see it as you continue your practice. He's had enough for now, Balthazar said, and grasped Christian's wrist, tugging him to sit down. Christian gratefully collapsed onto the sofa beside him. One of Balthazar's strong arms encircled his shoulder. Christian closed his eyes and breathed. His eyes flew open right away as he recalled that David was in the room. His gaze immediately went to the spirit. David continued to look upon him with utter longing. Christian gritted his teeth. Did he want to know what David was truly thinking? Or maybe he could guess. He wanted to tell Christian he was sorry. But it wouldn't be really sorry, because David would then turn it all around so it was about him, like he always had. Christian somehow would end up being the bad guy for all that had happened, even though he had been a teenager and David the adult. You've been quite good for a new master, Balthazar. I fully expected you to jump up and insist this all stop ages ago. Lizette chuckled. Christian knew that Balthazar actually had been wanting to jump up and insist that he rest quite a while ago. But one look between them, and his master had backed off. Yes, well, I do believe that the quicker Christian learns to control this gift, the safer he will be. And his safety and well-being are at the top of my list of priorities, Balthazar answered with a thin smile. Christian did not let his master's true feelings out of the bag. He knew enough about Lizette to guess that allowing her to see a weakness was a bad idea. Teaching a speaker is a unique opportunity, and I assure you that I will do my absolute best to keep him safe and sound. But there are unknowns. I am working only on the rumors I have heard passed down through the centuries. Lisette pointed out. So long as you remember, Lisette, Sophia said coolly. To treat Christian as if you were a treasure, and not like my own fledgling. Lisette challenged with a faint smile on her lips. Sophia shook her blonde head, her curls bouncing lightly. Come now, Lisette. We both know if a Cali fledgling suffers injuries during the practice of their gift, it is considered the fledgling's failure and theirs alone. If they cannot survive the gift, they are not worthy of survival. Lizette inclined her head. You may think it cruel and unfeeling, but I assure you that our ways ensure that the world stays safe for all. What do you mean? Christian asked. He had dragged his gaze away from David. The urge to go over to the spirit and try to harm it was strong in his blood. It wasn't logical. It was sheer emotion. But he knew that physical violence would beget nothing. Lisette set her cup on the coffee table and tapped her lower lip as she thought about it. Being a Kali is not like being any other type of vampire, except perhaps being a seer. But the danger they pose is only really to themselves. Christian glanced over at Sophia. She was usually so bright and cheerful that he often forgot about the burden she carried, which was to see the future. She was watching Lizette with large silver eyes, 
and sadness seemed to weigh her down at that moment as if Lisette's words held weight. Every vampire believes their bloodline is the best and most powerful, Balthazar remarked dryly as he massaged the back of Christian's neck. The tension bled out of him as those fingers worked, and Christian gratefully leaned his head forward. Having David here was more stressful than he would have imagined. Lizette's eyes narrowed. Ah, yes, but that is simple arrogance, not truth. I am speaking of facts. Really? How is being able to raise a bunch of bones more powerful than being able to change a person's mind? Balthazar challenged. You are here, a place you never thought you would be. Because of that, she inclined her head again. Yes, but other than yourself, Balthazar, how many Iros could have done that? None, I'd wager. A single Iros could control every country on Earth, Balthazar said. Nuclear weapons could be in the palm of our hands. We could rule the world easily. Isn't that the ultimate power? No, she answered with a little smile on her lips. Then what is? Christian asked. To replace faith with certainty, she answered. Every human being on this planet is ruled by their understanding of death, whether they think it is the end or whether they believe it is the beginning, whether there is a god or gods, whether there is a heaven, a hell, a purgatory. Catholics got rid of purgatory a while back, Arceus mused. Yes, well, it is irrelevant, because whatever they believe, it is all based upon faith, she said. But what happens when faith becomes facts? The Kali know that there is something beyond this life. We touch it daily. Imagine if a simple, stupid, low-level Kali were to expose that souls exist, that the body can be resurrected, that there is a place beyond. Imagine it. And Christian did. It would cause chaos if the reality of it spread. Religions would be upended. People might simply commit suicide or even homicide to get themselves and others through the veil. Life would become much cheaper. So, while the Iros could control the world, the Kali can send it into a chaos that not even you, Balthazar, could stop. She answered. Balthazar shrugged. Well, it probably explains why none of us has been allowed to go so far. The Iros do influence people all over, do they not? Lizette challenged. His master nodded. Yes, but we are limited in how much we are allowed to do by the council. And as you so rightly pointed out, my gift's strength is unique. So, basically, if a Kali fledgling uses their gift in such a way that causes harm to them or others, you don't help them? Christian clarified. Not quite so harsh. But those who are unable to control their gift after reasonable instruction are not seen as viable Kali. She explained. Viable? Christian thought. I'm glad she's not in charge of whether I'm seen as viable or not. Balthazar sensed his unease and drew him closer. One would think the master has failed to teach well enough, instead of the fledgling has failed to learn. Lizette laughed delicately behind her hand. We are not romantic about our fledglings, dear Balthazar. Only a few are expected to survive. We accept that from the get-go. Arceus shifted uncomfortably by the fireplace. It is a hard thing you must do, then. She lifted her hands. You should all be thanking us for our willingness to sacrifice for the common good. From a certain point of view, I can see that. Christian said softly. But that means there can never be any trust between Kali, and not even Master and Fledgling. Quite correct, she answered without hesitation. Perhaps we should continue your lesson. This spirit of yours is tugging at his leash. Not that he'll ever be able to escape me, but still. Christian reluctantly rose to his feet. There was no real reason to stand rather than to sit, other than it helped prepare him mentally to fight with David. He turned towards the spirit once more, and he felt that familiar stab of pain. Regret and shame when he saw David. His emotions swirled inside him with the same intensity of the first time. David gazed back at him with anguish. You shouldn't have lingered around me, David, Christian muttered. You should have stayed away, but you didn't. And now look where we are. He extended a hand towards the spirit, even though he had no plan to touch David again as he had before. He felt rather ridiculous, as if he were trying to use the force or something. And maybe he was. 
He tried to imagine tugging David towards him and the diamond that he held in his right hand. David did not move. He frowned, furrowing his brow, tightening his muscles, imagining his will being imposed upon the insubstantial vapor that David was. Nothing. Christian shook his head. This isn't working. I, I feel like I'm not touching him at all. You cannot touch him. He is a spirit. Do not think of him as a physical object. And you are not Asher, so you cannot move him with your mind. You must command the spirit. Lizette explained. But how? Christian asked. Balthazar was suddenly frowning. He put the pointer finger of his right hand to his temple, as he often did when communicating with Damon telepathically. King Damon just informed me that we are going to have another visitor. Who? Arceus pushed off the mantle, instantly alert. Sophia jumped down from the sofa arm and chirruped. Oh, good. We're going to be able to get Seer. What? Balthazar stared at her, a little unnerved. But before she could say more, the corner of the room nearest the fireplace blurred, and between one blink and the next, Damon, Christian, another vampire with the classic Cali pale blonde hair, and what can only be described as two werewolves appeared. Balthazar's mouth dropped open. Arceus's eyes went wide. Sophia clasped her hands together in seeming delight. Lisette and her silent minions all turned to stare. Their feelings were not readily apparent, but Christian knew they likely felt something as their expressions became as blank as dolls. And then there was chaos. Did you know that there is a Wraith Brain Discord? This is completely fan run. I have nothing to do with it, but it's been going on for years and it's absolutely great. On the Discord server, you will find fan art, fan fiction, discussions of lore, latest chapters, and even some fan run events. Since there are Wraith Brain fans all over the world, chances are that you'll always find someone up and chatting. The server is called Winterhaven, and I'll post the link in the notes down below. Without saying a word, Balthazar was suddenly across the room and had the unknown vampire pinned to the wall by the throat. He was snarling, silver eyes blazing, fangs out. The unknown vampire let out a gasp and spittle flecked his lips, but he did not try to fight, which was strange as it was clear that Balthazar loathed him. The werewolves, evidently this vampire's protectors, turned to lunge at Balthazar's back, but Arceus spun towards them. He kicked one in the head, then pinned that head to the ground with one of his huge boots. He grabbed the other around the neck and put it in a sleeper hold. They both howled and thrashed, but Arceus handled them with surprising ease. It was the first time that Christian had seen Arceus be anything but utterly gentle. The doorway to the room was suddenly filled with House Ravenscroft vampires. William lightly jumped over the back of the sofa and went to help Arceus with the werewolves. He slammed a hand into the werewolf's stomach, and it curled over onto itself. For a child, he was strong as hell. Isabel was suddenly grabbing Christian and pulling him away from the fight, using her own body to shield him from danger. He tried to fight her, but she easily caught his wrist, and he felt a wave of calm flow from her to him. She was trying to get him to do as she asked. No, not as she asked, as Balthazar did. Christian realized that this had all been agreed beforehand. Who was to do what in case of an emergency? Balthazar was sending out commands through his mind, and everyone was moving accordingly. But Christian was not leaving his master and best friend in this room with all this danger. Then suddenly the word, Stop, flowed out from Damon. His lips did not move. His expression was peaceful, but there was no getting away from the command. Christian didn't want to. His arms fell loosely to his sides as he stopped fighting Isabel, and she stopped trying to remove him from the room. And it wasn't just him. Everyone stopped. Even the werewolves ceased howling. They all looked like statues. So, this is King Damon, Lisette whispered. Her silver eyes flickered over him. He was dressed, or not dressed, really, in his long wolf coat and nothing else. Both his and Julian's hair was wet, so they truly had been swimming in the ocean despite the fall's chill. Even just wearing the wolf coats with wet hair, Damon looked as kingly as he always did. 
There was something about him that just compelled. Christian would normally have distrusted this, but he found he could not. But that only slightly bothered him because he knew Damon and knew he could be trusted. My king, you do know who this is. Balthazar let out a strangled laugh. Kamorn Losis. Yeah, we know. Julian answered for him. His best friend looked grim and not unhappy that Balthazar was throttling the Order's preceptor. Christian wanted to go to him, but there was no way to do so. Too many people and the werewolves were in his way. He could only send his good thoughts to Julian. His best friend went on. It turns out that his master is Cali, and he wants to join our team. The news fell like a bomb on the group. Everyone had been still before, but now they seemed to go rigid with surprise. Kamorn is a lily-livered piece of garbage, Balthazar said between clenched teeth. You think a normal Kali can't be trusted? Kamorn brings the idea of betrayal to a whole new level. I hold no love for you either, Balthazar, Kamorn said crisply. He was remarkably calm for a vampire being strangled. He seemed completely unafraid. Christian had to acknowledge that he was brave, if nothing else. One thing you definitely know about me is that I do what is in my best interests. And serving King Damon is definitely that. I have been betrayed and set up. I want my revenge. It was Arceus who spoke next. It is true that you always do what's best for you, Kaymorn. But what happens when you think serving King Damon is not best for your purposes? You cannot be trusted because you are incapable of being loyal to anyone or anything. Kamorn let out a laugh. Oh, <laughs> you would think that way, Arceus. You, who still supports the Order despite the fact that no one came to your defense. Not even Fiona. To my shame, I did not. It was Fiona who answered. She was in the doorway. Her eyes were fixed on Kamorn. So this is where you went, Kamon murmured, and Christian could almost see the calculation in the preceptor's eyes. Yes, are you really surprised? Blood slaves in Solus? The requirement that fledglings be sent to become confessors against their will, and the biggest issue of all, knowing that our texts in the Order were a lie. Fiona's silver eyes glowed. You always wanted certainty, Fiona. Black and white, fact and fiction, but religion is never that. He just wanted to believe it could be. Kamorn sneered. Balthazar slammed the back of his head against the wall. Kamorn barred his teeth and his hands curled into fists, but he released them and stood still. I cannot believe you let her in, Balthazar. It was your chance to turn her out into the cold. Why didn't you? Kamorn asked. Because he gives people who deserve it second chances. Arceus said. No, I don't think so. I think that he did it to please you, Arceus. That, and he's never been very bloodthirsty. Kamorn mocked. You should be glad of that, Christian found himself saying. It's the only thing keeping you alive now. The preceptor's eyes went to Christian. He took in Christian's form, saw the diamond that was slightly clenched in one hand, and then he saw David. David, who was still there. A speaker, he whistled. Balthazar must have tightened his hold on Kamorn's throat because he let out a wheeze. Do not address or even look at my fledgling, Kamorn. But I can help him, Kamorn offered. I am helping him, Kamorn. We do not need your assistance, Lizette said primly. C can't get him to go into the stone, Kamorn addressed Christian again. Christian hesitated, then shook his head, but said nothing. Kamorn smiled. She's been using Kali techniques. You are an Iros. Be one. The last was said clearly as a bell, and it suddenly made sense to Christian. He found himself turning towards David, and without hesitation, he held out the diamond. Then he reached for the spirit's mind. It was something he had shied away from. He felt it like a moth flapping its powdery wings in a lightly clasped hand. Come, he said, using compulsion. And David was yanked across the room and disappeared into the stone. Christian let out a bark of unexpected laughter. He stared into the diamond. I did it. It worked, Christian said. He looked up. Kamorn was smiling. 
Lisette frowned deeply, but not at him. She was clearly displeased with her own performance. Christian slipped the diamond in his pocket. He was in control again. Balthazar shoved Kaimon against the wall again. The shelves nearby wobbled. That's not going to save you, Kaimon. You should have never come here. I came by invitation of the king, Kaimon said with a strange smile. Damon, who had remained utterly silent, other than the single command, put a hand on Balthazar's shoulder. Iros. Balthazar let out a growl, but released Kaimon with that simple request. My king, he better give us something worthwhile. He will. It was Sophia who spoke. She came up to the two of them and took one of Balthazar's hands in hers and Damon's in the other. We can get Seer now, with Wyvern, Iros, and now Kaimorn's assistance. We can get to her. She's in the Spire, a place only the Preceptor can go. Kaimorn had been smoothing out his cloak and hair, but he went still at her words, and his eyes slid over to Damon. You have Seer imprisoned in the Spire? Arceus's voice was strangely inflectionless. Christian could almost see Kaimorn decided not to lie. He continued to straighten his clothing and not meet all the curious and bewildered gazes turned towards him. Is it true? Is Seer imprisoned in the Spire? Arceus's voice rose. One of the werewolves let out a whine as the confessor must have squeezed its throat a little tighter. Yes, Kaimorn finally answered with coolness. Every preceptor has kept her there and made her use her powers of prediction to help them in one simple goal. His eyes flickered over to Damon and away. Damon's red eyes were fixed upon him. Christian couldn't read the Vampire King's feelings or thoughts from that look, but he still wouldn't have wanted Damon looking at him like that. What goal is that? Balthazar asked. To stop King Damon from returning, Kaimon answered simply. Clearly. She's been lying to us all along. Join us next time for episode 68. I am Iros. Want to get the latest updates on what's happening with the podcasts, books, serials, manga, and the shop? Subscribe to our YouTube channel to get video notifications and see the community channel. Or you can be old school and join our mailing list. Links to both are in the notes. Thanks, guys, and we hope you join us. The Everdark Podcast by X Aratare is performed by Edward Fox, Adam Riley, Jay Thillis, Bruno Devant, Kelly Michaels, and Hannah Hart, with Liz Gentle as Seer, edited by Matthew Prince, continuity by Adriel Wiggins. Everdark is produced by Wraith Rain Publishing in association with Her Grace Reed Studios. Copyright 2022 by Wraith Rain Publishing.